Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Dimitris and this is Deep Learning with Python, the fifth chapter of the book. So let's start. Uh, in this chapter, we will see the fundamentals of machine learning. And here are the contents of the chapter. So this is more or less, uh, again, a theoretical chapter. Uh, from next session, it will be more deep in code. Uh, this is, I think, the last uh, theoretical chapter that we will uh, go through. So chapter contents, uh, first of all, we will try to understand uh, this tension between generalization and optimization, which is the fundamental issue in machine learning. We will explain what is optimization, what is generalization, how, what we try to achieve at which phase, and how we will try to achieve it. Uh, we will see various evaluation methods for machine learning models and also towards the end some best practices in order to improve the model fitting and also to achieve better generalization, which is the final target. So let's get started. First of all, generalization. Generalization is the goal uh, at every machine learning task. Uh, and we saw in previous uh, examples at the last session that we used, for example, the splitting of the data sets uh, in train, validation, and test. And we broadly explained that this is in order to uh, use data that are not seen by the model. And we also talked about the notion of overfitting. So overfitting is the key notion uh, regarding generalization and optimization. The idea is that uh, we have, first of all, the optimization. Optimization is the when we try to increase to have the best performance of the model on the trained data. So on the data that uh, the model trains, that the model sees, when we try to improve the performance on this data, this is called optimization. And there is the generalization, which is the performance of the model on the data that it has never seen before, like the validation data, the test data, or new data. And the goal is to have high generalization. So let's go through this uh, notion in more detail. Uh, we talked about the overfitting, so let's see a diagram uh, about what are the phases of a normal, of a healthy training of the model uh, in machine learning, especially in deep learning. So we have the phase of underfitting, which is the initial phase of the training, where the validation and the train loss, in this case, decrease more or less together. Then at some point, we have this phase, the robust fit, and after that, there is this phenomenon of overfitting where you can see that although the training loss continues to decrease and uh, hopefully it reaches almost zero, the validation curve start this, starts to increase. Okay, And this is a strange phenomenon because you could say that, okay, I trained the model to predict uh, this I don't know, classification or segmentation or whatever uh, task we have. But why doesn't it, it go worse than before? I mean, what happens? So what happens, we explained last time that is called overfitting. And there is this boundary between uh, underfitting and overfitting, the robust fit, which is what we try to achieve. So this uh, here is the best uh, balance between generalization and optimization. Now, what happens when we start overfitting model? So what happens is that in some cases, you have uh, the model starts to learn patterns that are very specific to the trained data, but they are misleading or they are not relevant when it comes to new data. And this is very important uh, to understand how this happens. So overfitting is likely to occur in one of these three cases. First of all, when you have noisy data, we will see in more detail all the all three of them. So noisy data, uncertainty, and rare features. So these are some of the most common cases where the data are responsible for the overfitting. Let's see in more detail these three categories. So let's start with the noisy data. And here you can see some data samples, some images that come from the MNIST dataset. If you remember, the MNIST dataset is a dataset with images 28 by 28 of handwritten digits. Okay, So you would expect to see handwritten digits like 
two, okay, or nine, something very clear. But in some thousands of data that it has, it has also these kind of things that are not very clear what it is. I mean, what is this number or this number? So noisy data, training data is a bad thing and we will see what we can do, but this is one of the reasons that we can have overfitting. Another one is a misleading labels. For example, here you have some, again, these are from the real image data sets from the train split. And here you can see that you have, for example, for this uh, image, that is, I guess we agreed on, the label actually is seven. Or here, I think we agree that it's a seven, more or less, but the label in the data set, it's four. So you have this kind of noisy, strange, or misclassified, uh, annotated, misannotated data. So these are some simple examples of a known data set that you can see that how the data can produce overfitting. So the model will try to classify this as three, no matter what, okay? Because we tell to the model, this is a three, try to do it. Uh, the model will try to classify this as three, but it will learn that if I see something similar, it will be probably three. So overfitting, better performance on training data, worse performance on validation data. Now let's continue and see what this would look like if we had this Latin space in 2D. So let's say that we have classification problem with uh, points in 2D space, uh, black and white. And here you can see the difference between a robust fit and overfit. So more or less this curve, this uh, boundary between the two classes would be a normal, a healthy, uh, robust uh, curve for fitting the data. Of course, you have some uh, cases that if this is a trained data set that are uh, mislabeled, misclassified like this one or this one, but it's more or less correct. Now, if you pass this robust fit phase and you go to the overfit phase, you have something like this. Now, here you have this classified correctly as white, but you have done this thing in order to classify it as white, which means that if at the test data you have a point here, a data point here, then you will probably classify this it incorrectly as white when it should be black because it's in this general area. So this is uh, conceptually what overfitting looks like. Again, this is what you try to avoid after a point. Now, this was the noisy data, the first category. The second category was ambiguous features. So let's see an example of what this would mean, for example. Uh, so let's say that we have a model. We train a model on the task of classifying a banana pictures. So we have the pictures of a banana at a, uh, I don't know, a factory that uh, takes this and produces something. And you have three categories, uh, unre, pre, and rotten. Okay. So more or less, you could agree that, okay, this is clearly category zero. This is clearly a banana of category two. But there are cases that it could be zero, it could be one, depending on who classifies this, right? So it's not very clear if it's at this or the next class. And this can lead to something like uh, this image, if you want to see conceptually what it would look like. So there is this clear area that is, let's say, category zero, and this clear area that is category one. But there are some cases in the boundary between them that there is some uncertainty even for the annotators, not only for the model, okay? So different annotators might annotate this point as uh, class one when other annotators might classify this as class zero, etc. So if we try to overfit on all this on this area, the uncertainty area, we might again end up to something like this, which again is overfitting and is something that we will try to avoid after we achieve it. So this is the second category. And let's see an example of the third category where we have some rare features or some spurious uh, correlations. For example, let's say that we have a task of uh, having the text like the uh, IMDB uh, data set where we have sentiment analysis as positive or negative uh, text, uh, I don't know, uh, for a movie uh, description, okay? Then there might be a comment that includes the word 
a, a very rare word, the word uh, cerimonia, okay? And there is only one data point in the trend set, and this happens to be a negative data point. Not because it has the word cerimonia, but because it's a negative, okay? Then the problem is that if the model is trained in a specific way, it might assign big weight, high weight in this word so that it will annotate as negative any new comment that will contain this word, even if this word is irrelevant to the categorization, to the classification of the comment as total as negative. And it doesn't have to be rare cases like a word that appears once or twice. It can be words that appear many times, but there is some slight difference in the, uh, in the ratio, for example. Let's say that you have 100 samples that include a specific word. And from these 100 samples, 54 are positive and 46 are negative, okay? So in this case, the model might consider that there is something mostly positive in this word because this word appears mostly highly, mostly in positive uh, uh, cases, right? In positive, in positive data sets, which means that even if there is some statistical flag, some complete statistical flag, the model might try to use this in order to classify correctly the train data. So these are some things that we try to avoid and we will see how we try to avoid. And then these are things that produce this overfitting. So this was in order to understand more or less what overfitting is and what are some possible uh, cases that uh, create this overfitting problem from the data part. Now let's see some examples say, using code to see how this can actually happen even if we don't add any information at all. So I hope you remember the MNIST dataset from previous sessions. It's uh, the 100 digits, and this is how we load and pre-process a dataset. So this train images includes these uh, images of 100 grayscale 100 digits. And uh, what we will do here is that we will create two uh, train sets that are similar to the original train images set, but in one of them, we will add a channel of a uh, white noise. And at the other one, the next one, we will add a channel of zeros. So in both cases, we add zero information, okay? So zeros have zero information, are data, but with zero information, and white noise, by definition, is data with zero additional information. So in both cases, we add zero information to the data. And yet, if we try to see what will happen, uh, if we try to fit a model on these two uh, information equivalent uh, data, we'll see that there will be some uh, difference. So let's run this code. This code just creates, a, is a function that gets a model. We have seen this thing before, nothing new here. We just train, create a model and we get the history for training on the train images with white noise and here with zeros. So what we do is that we will train models and then we will plot the curves to see what happened. So now we train on the zeros, the second one, it will end soon. And okay, it's complete. So let's see what happens uh, if we plot the validation accuracy, okay? So here we just plot the two curves. Uh, in both cases, we take the validation accuracy of the noise and the zeros history for all the epochs. And okay, let me scroll. Yeah, I have to, sorry, I have to do this to scroll. So here, what you see is something strange because the so this is the curve of the validation accuracy with the noise channel, the continuous one, and the dashed one is with the zeros channel. And although these are, again, information-wise equivalent, the zero one has better accuracy. And this is because when we add this white noise, it might be white noise for us, but for the model, it is data. And this data includes some kind of patterns, okay? And the model tries to figure out these patterns and to make a mapping between these patterns and the label that we say that it is. Even though these are not general 
patterns. The, the, it cannot generalize to new data using these patterns. So this is just a very simplistic demonstration that uh, even if we have some spurious, some statistically irrelevant fluctuation on the data, the result might change. So the model might overfit. Let's see another example. Actually, uh, let's. It's an important thing. So but it's this thing uh, that is fundamental for deep learning, and this says that deep learning models can be trained to fit anything. Okay, anything, anything you want, it can be trained to fit it as long as they have enough representational power. So this is very powerful, which mean, because it means that there's no task that we fundamentally cannot achieve, okay? There is no such thing. It's a universal approach, uh, care fitter. But this is also bad because since it can fit everything, it can fit also irrelevant information. And we will see this right now. So what we will do right now to demonstrate that it can fit anything is that we will take again the MNIST dataset. And what we will try to do is to make the model fit uh, the images to random labels. So what we do here is that we train the, the, get the train labels, make a copy. By the way, this is the way you make a copy of a, one of the ways to make a copy. And then we shuffle it. So these random train labels is the train labels, but shuffled, okay? Instead of having one, four, five, you have nine, six, zero, or whatever. And then we will create a model here, and we will try to train it to fit the images to random uh, labels. And we will also use a 0 0.2 uh, uh, rate of validation speed. So, okay, again, I have to do this. So here, uh, what you see is quite interesting. First of all, you see that the validation accuracy is always around 0 0.1, which is 10%, and this is because it's a balanced data set. So you, we have 10 classes. All of them include more or less the same number of, uh, of examples, which means that if we randomly pick a label every time, we have 10% uh, chance to pick the correct one. And this is exactly what this means. The strange thing is that the train accuracy increases. So we start with something very small, and you see that it increases, and it can increase if we leave it long enough with a big enough model and correct uh, uh, hypertuning, it can reach 99 or more percent, which is completely strange because we fit an image of three to the level of, I don't know, six, and then an image of a similar three to the level of eight, it doesn't make sense. And yet, it's a universal classifier. It can fit everything we want. And actually, it can fit even random noise to random labels. So if here we had, instead of train images, which is image of handwritten digits, if we used here some white noise, fixed white noise, to be uh, mapped to specific random labels, still it would be able. So the model can fit anything we want as long as it's big enough. Now, what actually happens is that the model doesn't learn something, just uh, functions as a Python dictionary. It has the key and the value and says, okay, whenever I see this, I don't care what this is, I don't care what patterns it is, I know I have learned that because of the specific values, I have to map it to this label, and that's all, okay? So this is the problem of overfitting. It overfits to exactly what the trained data include. And you see here that it continues to uh, increase 82% can increase more. So let's continue and talk about uh, it's the theoretical part, the manifold hypothesis. And uh, it might be quite strange, but it's important if you, if you are interested to understand how it really works and why it really works, the deep learning approach. So again, the MNIST dataset. Uh, the MNIST dataset is 28 by 28 pixels, images of pixels. Each pixel can take any value from 0 to 255 included, OK? Now, the total number of possible inputs of these combinations 28 by 28 with each pixel to be from 0 to 255 is a very big number. It's 256 to the power of 
784, which is way, way, way bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. But the actual hundred digits cannot be anything in this vast space, right? This 28 by 28 space. It only occupies a very tiny subspace of this parent space. And this subspace where these data points are in this 28 by 28 space has some structure. First of all, they are continuous. What does, what does this mean? This means that if we take a hundred and digits of, let's say, the number two, okay, it's white and grayscale, and we slightly change the value of one pixel, it will still be number two. It will not change, right? This is the feature of continuity. So this means that they are continuous. And this is very important to have because if we don't have continuity, which means that if we change slightly one pixel, value of one pixel, and it completely changes, we cannot generalize. We cannot fit something new. And the other important thing that uh, is not mentioned many times, it's mostly the first one that is mentioned, is that it's connected by smooth paths. Now, what this means is that we have this, uh, let's say we have the A data point and the B data point. The idea is that the sequence between A and B in some space, in some manifold, we will explain what it is, all these intermediate uh, data points still should be included in the data, uh, in the general data distribution. So they should look like digits. If we take a two and we take a zero, then the space between in the manifold, in the learned manifold, should continue look like all of them look like digits. And I mentioned the word manifold, so here is some kind of uh, loose uh, definition. It's a, a lower dimensional subspace of some parent space that is locally similar to a linear space. What does it mean? It means that if you have, for example, a curve, okay, in the 2D space, then this curve is a manifold. It's a manifold of one dimension in the 2D space. Why it's a manifold? Because it's continuous. And because locally, you can say that it looks like a straight line, okay? It's, we discussed about this also in chapter two, I think. So if you have a 2D manifold, it can be, uh, I don't know, a, a surface, okay? Whatever surface, imagine a sheet and, or a paper sheet uh, in the 3D space. So every high dimension or whatever dimensional curve or surface or something else that is continuous and has this smoothness is some kind of manifold. And the whole idea, the manifold hypothesis is that the data that we want the model to fit lay on some kind of manifold in some high dimensional space. And what I to actually find is this manifold. Now, here is an example about what I mentioned before, the second part that uh, connected, uh, that the points A and B are connected with smooth paths. So here we have the digit three in one side and in the other side we have the digit six. The idea is that on this manifold, the path that connects these two, one of the paths that connects these two digits still should look like a digit. And here you can see that it, this look like three and maybe this looks like a five. So in the, in the middle, it might not look exactly, but it does assemble something close to digit and then it turns to six. Here we have an eight, it continues to look like an eight up to maybe this point and then it turns to five, but all this should look like digits. And this is the idea of the manifold that this exists on some high dimensional curve that is continuous. And this is a strange thing. You see here that we have number two and number zero. And again, on this manifold, not just the interpolation between these, but the interpolation on the learned manifold is six. So in the middle, you see some six, right? Which is strange. And the idea is that exactly the interpolation is the source of generalization. Because uh, what you try to do is to make sense of the totality of the space using only a sample of this space, okay? So you, you know what happens in this area and you know what happens in this area. So the idea is that we can generalize what happens around this area, 
So if something that looks like two, you can still classify it correctly. And if you can go from two to zero, following a curve on this manifold that, uh, that includes digits. And you see here that on the manifold, the manifold interpolation between two and six and two and zero in this learned, this is the learned manifold of a specific model. And a different model might have a different path for this uh, data, okay? So the interpolation goes through six, pass through six. If we don't have a learned curve, if we don't have a learned manifold, if we don't have a learned model, it's untrained, then the interpolation between two and zero will look like uh, nothing like this, okay? So this means that we haven't learned a manifold because the intermediate doesn't look like something that could assemble a digit. What we try to do is learn a manifold that has this continuity and this smoothness. Now, why deep learning works? So the idea for this is what I mentioned also in the previous chapters, that what we try to do is uncrapple paper balls, okay? So we have, uh, again, this thing here is just a manifold, a 2D manifold on a 3D space, the real space. And what we try to do is uh, to get a, a tool, the model, that will uncrapple these paper balls and it will disentangle these Latin manifolds, okay? So, this is more or less what happens during the training. We start with something random. So we have this random board border be between the classes. And then slowly but steadily, we start to make a better distinction between these. Up to a point that we have a rob robust uh, fit. And we achieve this when we have something that like, looks like this. It's not perfect. You see here or here, but it's robust. And then if we continue training, it will look like this. Now, the difference is that during test time, this will uh, have a better performance because for new data that has never seen, it will most probably perform better correctly. Now, uh, we talked about the model and the whole approach of learning and what it tries to find this manifold, but let's talk about the data for the next uh, part. Now, the idea is that, uh, and why we say that we need big data is uh, that we shouldn't have very sparse sampling. So let's say that we have this uh, Latin space and that we try to find this curve, okay? And we have data points that are quite sparse. We have one here, one here, here, etc. okay? So if it's not very representative of this, then the model might find this curve instead of the correct care, which is this. On the other hand, if we have enough data that are representative of our task, uh, then it might actually fit the curve correctly. So very important is the trained data to be not to be sparse and to be also correct, because if we have data only here and we don't have on the edge, it will not work correctly. Uh, now let's go to the second part because we mentioned that we will also talk about evaluation approaches. So the splits. I mentioned the splits before and the idea is that we have, uh, I told you that we have the train and the test and then at some point that we should split the train to train and validation. And the idea for this is that uh, these three subsets have different functions. I already mentioned the function, but let's repeat it because it's very relevant to what we discussed today. Train data is the data that uh, the model will train on, okay? It will be data that the model has access to. The validation, now the test data is the data that we wanted to perform well. We also split the validation data and the validation data are data that we use in order to hype, to tune the hyperparameters of the model. So these are data that the model doesn't see directly. It has access only during uh, uh, inference, uh, during evaluation, but we can use this data in order to hyper -tune, to tune the hyperparameters. The reason we don't do this on test data is that every time we 
make an iteration every time we run a new experiment because we change the learning rate or the model architecture or whatever, then there is some piece of information that is leaked. And this information is leaking from the validation data to the model, somehow to the algorithm, the general algorithm. And if we repeat this again and again, and we want to hyper tune every parameter, uh, the correct loss function, the correct, uh, I don't know, balance in the data, in the classes, uh, the depth of the model, the width of the model, everything, then we have multiple repetitions and every time we leak more and more information, which means that after a point, we might have a model that performs very good also at the validation data, but it's not uh, representative which means that if we try to uh, fit them to evaluate the model on new data, other than validation data, it doesn't perform very well. And this is exactly why we use the test data in the end. And sometimes we have even a forced data set. We have the dev uh, for the development, and then we have the final test set in order to avoid this information leak. Now, uh, let's see some methods on how we can split the data. Okay, we said that we have the training data, but we split them in training validation. So these are some very simple approaches. We also talked about them uh, in the last chapters. So one, the simplest one is the holdout validation. So we have the whole data, and then we split it at some point, and we keep a part for validation and for part for train for training the model. This is the most common, and I mentioned that in case you have small amount of data, you can use k-fold. So again, the k-fold approach is that you make partitions, let's say three in this case, or five partitions in other cases, and you use one partition for validation and the other for training. And you repeat this, uh, this procedure with different partitions of validation. Then you get the scores, whatever metric you are interested in, and you get the average in the end. And this average will be representative of your parameters. So this pair of this set of, of hyperparameters leads to more or less this kind of score. So after you have fine-tuned your model using these repetitions, then you can use all the training data without keeping validation out and train on this. We will talk more about the data in a bit, but one important thing that uh, should be mentioned here is the common sense baseline. So I mentioned this, uh, uh, this thing at the previous session. Let's see in more detail what this means. So the idea is that you should always have a baseline, a common sense baseline for your model. And whatever, if your model is trained somehow, then it should, uh, be better than this common sense baseline. The common sense baseline should be something that you can achieve uh, trivially, very easy, without even learning in some cases. For example, for the image dataset, if you predict a random label, then you can have a 10% accuracy more or less, okay? Which means that if your model cannot even reach this 10%, then it's better not to use this model. This might seem okay, yeah, of course, but in other data sets, you might have something like 90% uh, of class A and 10% of class B, which means that the baseline in this case is 90%, because if you always output class A, you achieve 90% accuracy. So a good model should achieve at least 90, more than 90%. So, and again, it might seem trivial. It's not trivial in real life project, I have seen that in some cases, it's difficult to beat this uh, common sense baseline. And we will see actually an example in chapter 10, I think, 10, I think in chapter 10, where it's difficult to beat the baseline. Uh, things to keep in mind about the model evaluation. So let's see some things. Uh, first of all, I talked about the splitting of the data. Very important, the data must be representative which means that, uh, okay, you can say I split 80%, 20%. Yes, but if you keep the numbers from zero to seven for train and from eight to nine for test, this is not representative. You should at least suffer. There are more advanced methods like stratified uh, 
shuffling, but even a random shuffling is good in most of the cases. But there are cases like the arrow of time that shuffling is not good by itself because if you have data like time series where the direction of the series matters, for example, if it's a temporal data like a weather prediction or stock movement, stock market movements, okay? In this case, you should never include data from the future in the train set and from the past in the test set because what you actually try to do in this case is predict the past given the future. What you really want is predict the future given the past, which means that you shouldn't randomly shuffle, you should use the past data for training and then you can shuffle internally and the future data for test and then shuffle internally. Otherwise, there is this thing called temporal leak where you leak information from the future to the past. Another thing is the redundancy in your data. So there are many cases where in real life data sets and projects where you have the duplicates. So if you just take the whole data set with the duplicates, so images or text that appears twice or more times, and you just randomly shuffle, then you will have the same data point to appear both in training and test sets, okay? Again, but, and you might think, yeah, of course I will remove the duplicates. It's not that easy. I mean, I have seen this exact problem because there are big open source data sets uh, with tens of thousands of data points, for example, X-ray images. And you say, okay, I will use this. It's open for training. I use this and I use this. And then at some point after some weeks, you see that something is wrong and you realize that some hospitals are common in these uh, uh, open data sets and you have to figure out how to distinguish this case. So. It's a common problem. Generally, the data preparation, the data cleaning, the data cleaning is very huge. It's very important. Sometimes even more important than your model. Uh, and there is this approach nowadays that okay, let's pay more attention to the data-driven uh, deep learning. And there is Andrew C that promotes this. So it's a big thing. Data is very important, and we understand it more nowadays. Uh, improving, improving model fits. So uh, now let's see, we talked a bit about the data. We will talk again about the data, but uh, let's see different problems that uh, might you might come up uh, during training. So let's say that you have your splits, you have your model and you start training. One case would be that the training does not start, okay? So you have your loss, your train loss, not decreasing. This should never be the case, and we will see in more detail. You might have the, the case that the training starts, so the training loss decreases, but it does not generalize. Uh, or you have the case that uh, the both losses goes down, but uh, it does not overfit, so the validation curve does not go up, it just stays down, which is bad, although it seems good. Now, uh, let's see the first uh, case. So let's take the MNIST again, uh, quite easy. We pre-process it, we have the model, we compile it, but here we use high learning rate, okay? We use one instead of a dot on 0.01. And we train this, uh, everything looks correct other than that. And we see that, okay, you cannot see, let me... This. And we see that it doesn't learn, okay? It's around 23, 25% and that's all. It doesn't get any better. So this is bad. Something fundamentally bad happens here. And this, you can always overcome this. Again, the model can fit even random data, even noise. So it definitely can fit the, in the digits. So this, is always the case that you can overcome it. Let's see how we can, one thing that we can check. So the most common thing for this, a uh, common cause for this error is that your learning rate in combination with your batch size is wrong. So here we fine tune the learning rate and we see that immediately it starts learning accuracy 90% and it becomes, uh, okay, again, it becomes better. And also the validation accuracy uh, becomes good, so 
So here you can see that by changing this little thing, you can overcome this never start training uh, problem. Let's see a different. Uh, so in this, again, one thing that you have to check is your learn grades. Another is the batch size. These are connected uh, reversely. Now, uh, the model capacity. So let's see another problem that might uh, occur. So let's take the MS dataset and try to apply logistic regression. So no hidden layer, just one layer, input and output, just that. And we try to fit it and we see that it does fit, but not that good. I mean, it reaches 91% and this 92, 91, more or less same, but it doesn't overfit, okay? Now let's leave it train and see the uh, curve. Let's plot the curve. Okay, so it's completed. And now let's see what it looks like. So you have a curve like this. Now, this is a validation loss, okay? Now the train, the validation. And you see that it goes down and stays down. And you might think this is a good thing. Uh, this is a bad thing, okay? You always want to see overfitting. You always want to see the validation loss to go up after a point. If it doesn't go up, it means that it can learn. It can probably learn more. So the first thing you try to achieve when you train a model is overfitting. Then you try to decrease the overfitting. But you first want to see the overfitting. Here we don't see overfitting. We don't see it go up. So what we will do is that we will add two more layers to see if we can achieve overfitting. And here you can see that uh, it becomes, uh, so it increases and after a point it will start decreasing. So let me, no, I cannot. Yeah, I don't know why it's stuck. Give me a second. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sometimes it does this. So the idea is that we will see now the curve and here it is. So you see that it goes down and after a point it goes up, which is exactly what we want to see. So the next thing we want to do after we achieve overfitting is to improve the, so this is the optimization. The next thing we want to do after we have this is to improve the generalization. So try to achieve better part here or stop it here or regularize somehow the model. So let's see what we can do. So next target after overfitting is improving generalization. So again, one of the things we can do is check the data. We said that before that one of the main causes for overfitting is the data uh, and the issues in data, rare cases or misleading labeling. Uh, uncertainty, all the various uh, fluctuation, statistical fluctuations, etc. So data creation, very important. One thing, not enough data. So we have to increase the, to have more dense sampling of the space of the data set, okay? Uh, and representative. Again, we talked about how to split, how to uh, make sure that it's random, that we don't have temporal leak, etc. Another thing is to minimize the labeling errors. So if you have texts, read the text. If you have images, visualize the images. See the images. It's very common that you have data sets that are of some 10,000 uh, images or, 20 or whatever. And you say, okay, it's a good one, and I will add also this one, and I will start training. And you see that something is wrong, and you try to change this, change that. And after some weeks, you say, okay, let's see the data, and you see the data, there are some crappy data, they are dark images or something completely irrelevant. So spend time, it's almost always better to spend time to curate the data than to fix or create a new architecture for the model. I said it again, very important, data curation. Another thing is uh, to clean the data from missing values. So let's say that you have tabular data. I uh, don't know how to predict the weather based on temperature, wind speed, whatever, whatever. And then you have uh, the sensor not working for some hours, so you have some missing data or other kind of data set that you usually have in real life projects. 
missing levels. Deal with it, either remove or uh, replace or do something with the missing values. If you don't do something, the model will not uh, be able to generalize probably correctly. If you have many features, try to reduce the number of features, the dimensionality, do feature selection or do feature engineering. Let's see some example of what does this mean. And it's actually very important, the feature engineering that we say that, okay, it's a deep learning model. We don't need to engineer the features. The model will learn the patterns. Yeah, you have to help the model to learn patterns. For example, let's say that we want to, to make a predictor for what time it is, okay? One way would be to feed the pixels of the clock, okay? So here, yeah, maybe the model will learn, but it will be very difficult because you have so much information that is not relevant. All these values of all these pixels is not relevant. What is relevant is these two uh, clock hands. So one thing would be, okay, just feed to the model the coordinates of this point and this point, that's all. So you can just feed this instead of all this information. Or even better, so this is to reduce the dimensionality, the features, the number of features. An even better thing would be to change the coordinate system to use uh, uh, the angles. So what is the angle for this one and for this one and pass only this information. So the whole idea of feature engineering is that you as a programmer use your own knowledge about the data and about the machine, the algorithm that you will try to feed. So using your own knowledge, your priors, both for the data using feature engineering and for the model, a more suitable architecture, for example, or type of layers, helps the model in some cases a lot. So the idea is to apply this hard-coded, these non-learned transformations of the data before the data go to the model. And this will, in many cases, makes the job of the model uh, easier. So the idea is that the good feature have less resources and in some cases less data. So the information value of the features is important. Uh, another way to avoid overfitting, we saw before it's uh, early stopping. So in previous cases, we stopped the training of the model. Uh, we saw okay, in, around this epoch, it starts overfit. So I will train up to this epoch. Of course, there are better ways. You can use uh, uh, some callbacks to save the best model or to stop the training if it does not improve after a while. We will see these callbacks in more detail in the next chapters. I just mentioned them. And the, I think last thing regarding the overfitting apart from the data and the train process is the model itself. So try to regularize the model. And regularizing means to make it more regular, more generic, more smooth, okay? So these are some ways that you can uh, use in order to achieve it. First of all, reducing the network's size. So if you see that it overfits, then you can start reducing the size because after a while, I mean, if it's big enough, it will memorize the data. So when you reduce the network size, you limit the memorization, the memorization resources. Another thing that you can do is to regularize the weights themselves. So we explained that each layer has some weights, some parameters, and these parameters can get any value. What you want to do is keep these values quite small and similar, okay? So one way to achieve this is to use weight regularization. So this is a common way to mitigate overfitting and it is to put some constraints on the complexity of the model. And the complexity of the model has to do with the weights in big part of the model. So by forcing these weights uh, to take only small values, then you, this makes the distribution of the weights of the weight values to be more regular. And this is something that you want to achieve, to have more regular distribution. So let's see an example. You have the original model here. Let's start training and while explain. So the idea here is that we take the IMDB uh, dataset. We have seen this before, vectorize it. We have seen this before, just a model sequential with uh, three layers. Everything here, we have seen this before. And we train it and we have the history original, okay? 
Now, what we will do is that we will say, take the same experiment and we will add some regularization on the weights. So we have the same thing, but here we add this in the tense layer, which is the kernel regularizer, and we will use L2 regularization. And the difference here is that we force by adding some uh, part in the loss function, the weights of these specific models to be small, small as small as possible, okay? And what we can see, we plot the uh, two curves. So here, what we do is that we take the validation loss of both the original and uh, the regularized one with L2. And what we see is that, so the dust one is the original. The continuous one is the regularized with L2 for the weights. What we see that this model overfits very, very, much, but this model doesn't overfit that much, okay? It does overfit a bit, but it's much smoother. So, of course, here we, you have overall a better validation, but this is not the point. The point is that the regularization of the weights of the model is one way to avoid overfitting. Now, apart from this, uh, there are different regularizers uh, that you can experiment with, uh, like L1 or L1 and L2, a combination. Uh, the problem with this is that uh, weight regularization may work for smaller models, but when you have a, a bigger model, it doesn't usually work well. So for large deep learning model, it tends to be so over-parameterized that when you impose these constra this constraints on the weights, it doesn't have any impact uh, in the final result. So there is a different way that we can uh, regularize big uh, models, and this is called dropout. So dropout is very, very common. It's used very much. And this is more or less the idea is that you take all the outputs, all the activations of one layer, and then you zero out some of them randomly. So here, let's say that are the activations of one layer. And what you do is that you zero out, uh, let's say 50% of them randomly. And of course you have to multiply the remaining ones by the inverse, so by two in this case, uh, in order for the average activation of the layer to be uh, the same. Now the idea was, uh, let's see how we will use this. Uh, so the idea is that we have the original model, but in this case, we have added this dropout. So you can use it by clash.dropout. And here you can write what is the dropout rate, how many of the activations should be dropped out, should be zeroed out. And by adding this, uh, let's train this, uh, you will see that it, it overfits slightly less than the original model. Uh, Okay, so it's trained, so let's plot it now. So again, we plot the validation loss, both from the original model and from the uh, dropped out model, the one that we saw now. So the dust, the original one, again, it overfits like before, uh, quite hard, but the dropout model overfits a bit less, okay? And this is a, just a simple demonstration. Of course, in other models with different data, with different architecture, it might be more or less. You have to experiment with this. But the general idea is that you first want to achieve overfit, and then you want to regularize somehow the model or the data or curate the data in order to achieve better generalization. So let's, uh, because it's already time, let's uh, talk about the summary and wrap it up. And then we can pass to the QA uh, part. First of all, the purpose for training the model is to achieve good generalization. Okay, this is the goal. Of course, we have access only on the, the model has access only to what to the training data and you can use only what you can see. So we go through optimization in order to achieve generalization. Now generalization is uh, again achieved by interpolating between samples. So a new data point will not be exactly the same from the train set, 
But if we have a good generalization, which means that we can interpolate between the samples, we can predict correctly new uh, uh, data. So the idea is to learn this Latin manifold from the trained data and that the new data, the test data, lay also on the same manifold. If this is the case, then we can achieve better generalization. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning, there is this uh, there's this balance between optimization and generalization. And again, we first want to achieve uh, optimization, which includes overfitting, and then we try to achieve better generalization. Uh, I talked about the splits also in previous sessions. In this session, we will talk about it say, in the future. It's very important. Uh, you use the train set to train, validation to, hyper, uh, to tune the hyperparameters, and in the end, you only run ideally once on the test set. And that's what the performance of the model is. And this is because every time you, you change a parameter, a hyperparameter using the validation set, you have some kind of information leak to the model, to the internal algorithm. Now, again, the goal is first to overfit and then have the generalization. And uh, one thing that you can do if, for example, you cannot do none of them, you can tune the learning rate or the batch size so that you start having a, a good performance on the trained data or change the architecture prior. You might use the wrong layer or the wrong architecture. That's why your model cannot train, perform not even at the training data. Or you might have very small model. You have to increase or later on decrease the model capacity. Or you just have to train for a logger. If you train for five epochs, sometimes it's not enough, even 10 epochs. You might need 50 epochs in some cases. Uh, and after you have overfitting, you try to improve the generalization, which, which means that you can start regularizing the weights of the model or just uh, or using dropout or uh, curate the data or use early stopping. So many, many ways. And we will see again some of these ways in the next chapters. So that will be all for this session. It's time. Uh, thank you.